And uh, hello, hello, hello everyone and welcome, welcome, welcome to the last uh, session in our leadership series and today we will be joined by the amazing, the incredible Buzz Pierce. Hi Buzz. Hello. Can hello. you hear me all right? I love oh, well. your background. You're like in the sky. Well, you know, we've got to put on a good show for you guys, right? <laughs> Well, it's so good to have you. And for everyone who is joining, who might not know this face and this brilliant person behind the face, it's uh, the famous Steve Buzz appears. I will call you Buzz if you don't mind. Uh, and uh, we will uh, be talking about your career that you had at all sorts of companies, including Skype and as a global head of design at Skyscanner and now SVP of design at checkout.com. I would love to know more about what SVPs of design do. And I'm sure lots of people have questions about that role and how incredibly stressful and challenging that must be. But before we dive into all these interesting topics and conversations, I would love to ask you 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I think so. Let's go for it. <laughs> Let's go for it. Okay. Tea, coffee or beer? Uh, tea. Describe yourself in three words. Kind, chilled, disorganized. Uh, that's a, it's a great combination. I love the, the, the kindness and the chillness. I definitely can see that vibe. Don't know about the disorganized. Haven't seen that. Uh, your favorite book? The Bible. Good one. The thing that annoys you the most? Lying. London or New York? London. What's your superpower? Oh, these are supposed to be rapid fire. I, I honestly, I don't know. Uh, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Professional achievement you're the most proud of? I think I'm most proud of the work that we did when we were at Skype which was um, to have simultaneous translation whilst on a call. But not only that, uh, it was, uh, we made a very clear prototype, which was um, the ability for deaf people to sign and then have it translated as well. So you could have an avatar and so on. And it just, um, when we put that in front of uh, people, the tears of joy uh, ran down their faces. It was a very, moving moment to break down those kind of barriers and enable technology to do that so yeah i love that oh that sounds like an incredible project working from home or office fun office yes i vote for that as well uh do you have a favorite place in london or a sport or it could be a street it could be a cafe i i do love our local park Beckenham Place Park uh, and the Homestead Cafe there. It's very nice. It's where yeah. I go to unwind. That's amazing. And the last question, what's the best part about working in product design? I think it's the, the joy of seeing something that's very intangible in a collective mind becoming tangible. I, I never uh, lose enthusiasm for that. Thank you so much for answering these crazy rapid fire questions and being calm and um, very conscious about this. I, I love your answers and thank you for, for going through this. Now we can be more chilled and go through all the other questions that we have, okay. which I'm very excited to discuss with you because I mean, we had so many conversations um, and off camera and talking about all sorts of things, including leadership and team management and design vision and all sorts of things that I enjoy talking to you about. So I am so happy that finally other people can hear your thoughts and your perspective on all things design. But I would okay. love to actually start with uh, your childhood because I always feel like you can understand a lot about person by hearing where they grew up, what kind of family they grew up, what kind of parents they grew up with, uh, that actually, I feel like, influences our decisions in our life a lot. So could you tell a bit more about 
What was your childhood? What do you remember about it? And what did your parents do? I'll try and keep this short and sweet. Well, I have two very uh, creative parents. Uh, my mother is amazing at crafts, uh, always sewing and making things. And um, my father is an architect. Uh, so it's kind of in, in the blood that making and uh, is very much there. I suppose in terms of role models, my my father is one of 11 children. Uh, so, and all of his uh, siblings are married. So I come from a very large family. Um, I have two younger brothers um, and a lot of cousins, as you can imagine. So it's somewhat of a bit of a, a legendary thing when people know me, it's, I come from very large families. And I think that really, um, that does shape you enormously. Uh, it teaches you to be very uh, easygoing, I suppose, and not, uh, you know, deal with lots of different personalities uh, and to be kind of calm when asked to do something. But I think, you know, my father was my, my big uh, kind of uh, hero, uh, seeing him draw, uh, you know, back then it was, there was no CAD, um, you know, it was all the draftsman's table and the exquisite kind of precision and detail and him teaching me how to do these things. I was just uh, kind of in awe of that. And um, I would like to take things apart and understand and our best family friend who lived next door but one to us is just an amazing mechanic. Um, and uh, we would build all sorts of things together, go-karts. He would show me how the gears work and so on. So there's always just a fascination between how something looked and what it would do for people and how that kind of inspired people, but also how it worked. Now, these sound like classic archetypal designer um, backgrounds, but uh, yeah, all of that in very in living in the country. Um, I grew up in Su East Sussex uh, with South Downs on our doorstep. So um, I think of my childhood as being one of privilege really because we had a nice big garden and we were just constantly making. I think one of the things uh, maybe surprises people, we didn't grow up with a TV. Um, so it was always out and about making in my dad's workshop and whether it be bike ramps or a new set of goal posts or tree houses. Um, yeah, it was just the joy of making. Uh, I still get immense joy from that, whether that's digital or physical. So I love it. And uh, as, especially when you mentioned that you didn't have a TV and now you work in a digital world, that's an interesting transition to not care or worry about what's going on in, in, in digital technologies now to being immersed and fully uh, working on something that is 100% digital. Uh, when did you kind of figure out that passion, not just for craftsmanship and creativity in general, but potentially for something that will lead you to this field of product design or digital design? Yeah. Well, I remember very, very distinctly. Um, in, in the UK, schools often have uh, work experience just prior to doing your GCSEs. And um, I was fortunate enough to go to a little company in Lewis and uh, they were a graphic design agency. Uh, I'd not really heard of a graphic design agency. I was still reading books from, you know, Dick Powell, uh, from Seymour Powell, you know, the seminal design techniques kind of book and looking at airbrushing and all of this stuff and wanted to hone my craft there. And I go into this, I have a week there and I see uh, an Apple Mac, I see a Quadra. And I'm kind of just struck by this uh, machine. I'd never actually seen one before. And, um, and they let me loose on it. Uh, and it was, I was using Quark Express back then. And um, I just seemed to kind of intuitively pick it up. And to me, that was just, I enjoyed it so much that I could create things very, very quickly and have the output very quickly. Um, and uh, then started my kind of journey, I suppose, do I go down architecture route like my father, but eight, nine years in, in uh, education, which was not something that I really wanted to, to do. I wanted to kind of get out there and start making as quickly as possible. And um, 
I was encouraged to take a job there. They, they did offer me a job straight away at 16. Um, but I did feel like it was important to get some, some fundamental basics, you know, grounded um, at university. So, yeah, um, that to me set me on a trajectory for my love of typography and communication. Um, but then, of course, at university, the Internet happened. And um, one thing led to another. And here we are today. Wow. Um, and uh, I can totally imagine you um, being amazed at graphic design and being offered a job at 16. I feel like you have this incredible power to mesmerize people with your talent. And I, I've seen that happening many times. And I'm not surprised that someone saw that talent when you were 16 and offered you a job on the spot. Um, and I wonder what would have happened if you didn't go to university and just... Uh, went straight into that but you you chose this career path and you built an incredibly successful career through all the companies that you worked at and it felt like i don't know if it was strategic or not but you had a very clear career path progressing from designer to head of design to now svp of design um and uh, i suppose not everyone takes that route because some prefer to stay more in the craft and, and the making and be individual contributor and uh, be the person who does, but you clearly enjoy um, helping others and kind of having more managerial position. So could you tell a bit more about that kind of journey and transition from being someone very hands-on to leadership position and what were your misconceptions and, and kind of learnings on the way uh, when you started going up and up this career ladder? Well, I, I can tell you right now, it, it is a complete roller coaster. I wouldn't say that I did it. I did it consciously. If I, I never really had a plan, like, hey, I want to get to here by then or anything like that. I think it was very much in my 20s was, um, you know, head down and, and deliver uh, the work and hone your craft um, and doing that in, in the agency world was, you know, very rewarding. Um, and you get a sort of a breadth and a depth of experiences there and different kind of problems to go solve. Um, I think uh, it gets really, I suppose, interesting from my perspective is when I went from Poke, the agency, to Skype. Whilst I had the title of, say, design director at I wasn't managing anyone. We didn't, we had a very flat structure. Um, and then going into being creative director at Skype um, was my first baptism into competency frameworks and performance reviews. And I'm um, being blunt, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. And I, I really didn't have to cry out for help. Um, and of course, you get a lot of quizzical looks like, what are you doing here? You're managing a team. And you don't have a clue about this. And so people were very gracious there. Um, and I think it was at that time where, you know, Skype was really kind of exploding. Um, and there were a lot of other people there who were also in the same boat who had never managed teams and never managed people. And we were very fortunate to be put on some very uh, good courses there um, to, to help accelerate that and, and teach us those skills. So I suppose it's, it's really a sort of, one of not me necessarily desiring to want to manage people. I don't wake up every day and think I'm going to manage. Um, I think it's more a case of how can I be a positive uh, person in the workforce that inspires people to be able to do the best work of their lives. Um, and in be, you know, as, as encouraging as I possibly can, I, I do get a lot of uh, joy from that. Um, but I wouldn't say my, my career was uh, plotted in any kind of conscious means. So um, you, you mentioned the course that you took at Skype or some training that you had access to. What were those skills that you felt like helped you the most in that situation from being clueless about managing people to actually, huh, maybe actually I, I, I can do it? Yeah, um, I think there was, there was a bit of trial and error. I think one of the very first things to me that was very important is I wanted people to be honest with me. You know, naturally when you have a senior position, you want people to, to talk to you and 
tell you maybe where you're failing and not working, but that's, that can be quite scary for someone who's more, uh, you know, starting out on their career. You know, I can well remember, you know, some designers kind of presenting to me and they were shaking. And I was like, what's going on here? Why are they, you know, why is they so scared? And, you know, I, I remember bringing this up in uh, one of the sort of uh, forums where we were sharing our experiences. And of course, that was the first, I suppose, place where it wasn't called that at the time, you know, psychological safety, um, making people feel comfortable um, in those surroundings so that you have that level playing field um, that people can f be themselves and actually push back and disagree and have that open kind of dialogue and not, not feel like they're going to be penalized by me for disagreeing with me. And I think that's where bad managers, I think, uh, go wrong is they go, oh, that person disagreed with me, therefore I'm going to hold them back in their career. Actually, people that disagree with me, I would tend to go up in my estimation because you need that. You need to have that healthy, I was going to say conflict, but just robust interrogation of the problem and put, put the work there. And I think the the metaphor that really stuck in my mind was this is, well, look at how doctors treat the patient. You'll have a multiple amount of doctors on one patient and they're attacking the the situation from different perspectives, but it's not, they're not attacking each other. They're looking at how to make the patient better. And that's always the construct I try and create is like, don't go for people, you know, individually <laughs> look at the, the, the work. Um, and that way you can help disconnect yourself a little bit and not feel, I suppose, so uh, kind of torn apart if your work um, potentially uh, isn't necessarily solving the problem correctly, but actually, okay, then what do we then do to help support you uh, to actually make it work better? And how do we make the solution better? So it's always about the patient doctor analogy that I remember, that's just one, uh, thing from those kind of courses that really helped create some constructs and playbooks in how to run crit sessions, for example. So that's amazing, and I love that you mentioned the importance of debate and uh, importance of discussion. Um, and I feel like that's something that can be very challenging, especially in a creative world, because everything that we create we take very personally. And I can imagine for to take criticism for any creative person is very hard. Uh, so having a space where everyone can give everyone feedback, it's, uh, it's difficult to create, but very important. Um, are there any ways where you can encourage to create that space where everyone feel confident uh, to share their honest opinions? Yeah, I think when you, um, when you enter into these spaces, it, it's always good to kind of almost run through the ceremony. Like here's the rules of engagement here's why we're here and you kind of almost bake it into that and you exercise the muscle and create that space. Um, but there's also the follow-up, right? Which is the quality of feedback. You know, at, at the moment we're kind of going through maturing our, our crit sessions as we build the team. Um, and I suppose we, we loosely uh, go through the kind of six, 30, 60, 90 kind of model where, at what stage are you in the process and therefore what kind of feedback are you looking for um, just to give more clarity uh, to the situation. But then the follow-up is, you know, I think it's really important that you, that you encourage people afterwards quickly and kind of say, Hey, great job, you know, real time feedback, you know, that thing you did there, that was great. Do that again. And you know what? People do it again. Um, and you, you want to focus on all the good things that you do and create that thing. And then if you do have something potentially, you know, you might perceive as being quite negative uh, or I always look at this and try and say things in the kindest possible way. Now, that might be a bit of cultural uh, side of things, but I think that's always uh, my general modus operandi is uh, 
in the conflict and the sensitivity of things, um, the first time you kind of give feedback, it's it's always nice to uh, do that as compassionately as possible, but then offer some potential routes of, of solutions and what they might do so that they're not, not left hanging and you haven't kind of taken their head off. Um, but it's always about the work, right? That's the point. I love it. And uh, definitely kindness is something that sometimes very difficult to remember when you are in a stressful situation or you have to make tough decisions or give difficult feedback. Uh, and um, I, I can imagine that uh, you have that skill perfected uh, very well. So it's, um, uh, I feel like it's, it's always good to, to remember that we should all be kind. Uh, and kind of going back to the, to the journey that you had, and so you, you established yourself at Skype and you did incredible work there. And then you moved to Skyscanner again to the new challenge and kind of this again, growing company. What I suppose it required from you that as a, as a leader, as a manager, that was different. And again, what new skills did you have to get on that level? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my, my journey uh, at Skype was very much one of uh, observing the kind of roller coaster and being part of it, you know, being bought and sold three times and then ending up at Microsoft. Um, you learn an awful lot in those situations. So that was amazing uh, to see how that was orchestrated um, and, and contributing to it. When when going into to Skyscanner, it was definitely one of a very different culture uh, than Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> there was uh, the context of, I was based in London with about three others at that time and uh, Edinburgh was the spiritual home, still is, I suppose, the th spiritual home of Skyscanner. Naturally, uh, the questions were sort of arising of where's the gravitational kind of shift going to happen as London became more bigger and bigger. And I think the big learning there was how do you consistently show that it's not an us and them mentality when you're distributed? that is a very real thing that happens. And you have to constantly put yourself in the mindset that it's you know, most respectful intentions, best intentions, because when people are out of sight, out of mind, um, well, they're not out of mind, but you can start to invent things of what people are doing and how it affects you um, or how what you're doing is affecting them. And communication then becomes the key to making sure that you're keeping keeping track of that um, because people can overthink things and spiral out of control and then in you know the mind plays all sorts of tricks and I think that was the biggest um, learning for me uh, being the kind of leader as the whole team as we scale it up is well what are, what is Edinburgh responsible for what is Budapest responsible for what is San Francisco responsible for how do you create centers of excellence where do we distribute that was a real challenge for me um and sort of six months in yeah there was there was a real wobble uh where um yeah i was i felt like i was really failing because it takes an awful lot of patience to see the kind of groundwork and then it starts to take off um, not to use a flight metaphor there but um uh you know and, and i think i remember one of the key quotes from uh, my good friend Brian Dove, who was a uh, former CEO of Skyscanner, I think it, I think it may be a Jeff Bezos uh, saying, um, but the, cr the critical thing is to be strategically patient, but tactically impatient, and you're constantly having that uh, that tension between the two, um, and often we want to get to where we want to get to much quicker, but you have to bring people along with that and kind of calmly, it's okay, we're making progress. How do you make that progress visible and how do you constantly report it and communicate that? And then you feel like you've got the, the momentum. And I think that was the big, uh, the big one for me that at that point in time in Skyscanner. And of course I got a coach, which was a real big help. So 
I will I want to talk about the coach as well because I think that's a really really interesting discussion but I want to go back to one of the points that you just mentioned about communicating your progress and what you're doing I assume you're talking about what the design team doing reporting that to the rest of the business and kind of showing the progress is that what you mean and how how do you do that yeah I mean it's it's multifaceted when you report right um you're going to have different cadence for different kind of levels of reporting. So, you know, in a leadership team, you're going to have a weekly rag, you know, red, amber, green, very quick. Okay. Which ones are red and so on, but that's all about reporting that against your OKRs. And I think at, at, um, at Skyscanner, we went through several kind of iterations of, do we have OKRs or do we have goals? And we sort of, uh, went through different models as we were kind of figuring out how we scale and how we make people accountable and so on. And that was, that was quite a bit of turmoil, but where I've landed right now, I think that the best model is generally quarterly planning it seems to be a good kind of cadence on setting goals on a quarterly basis, because then you can really kind of attack it. And that way you're not micromanaging the teams, right? You're not constantly asking, you're kind of, here's your goal. How are you doing? Here's your key results. And this is going to sound really obvious to a lot of people, but actually when you're doing scale, when you're in the scale up modes, the startup doesn't really have OKRs. They haven't really needed to because the organization is small enough and intimate enough to work without it. But then you start to go through this scale up phase where, you know, you're hundreds and hundreds of people and you're just distributed and you've got to find mechanisms to track it uh, whilst preserving some of the cultural kind of, velocity and integrity that made it special in the first place um so communicating those things you know on a weekly basis is just short nuggets you're responsible as a leader you know what to communicate but then you have very critical milestones and uh way the which we ran them there was you're the responsible for booking those milestones in and communicating uh what we're actually doing um and then we generally had a twice yearly annual event where the whole of Skies kind of got together. And that, that would be where you would kind of paint the vision. But you'd also retrospectively go, this was what was achieved. And you sort of celebrate those points in time. And I know you're probably going to start asking, you know, the value of design and so on. Uh, so before we get to that. But I know I'm not, I mean, you're very flattering in saying I'm a good communicator. I might be able to communicate verbally, but it's not my strongest thing i have to work really hard at writing what we're actually doing you know quarterly business reviews and so on um perhaps it's me being mildly dyslexic and so on but that's not something i wake up in in the, uh, in the morning to do but it's a very necessary thing uh for for a leader of any discipline to communicate very succinctly uh what's kind of going on being very open and honest about the failings but also what you're going to do to correct it. Um, and I think that's where, you know, you asked earlier, you know, what does a senior vice president of design do? Well, you're highly accountable. You know, you're expected to run your own organization without any kind of particular oversight and so on. Um, and, and that's, that requires, I suppose, a backbone of steel, <laughs> not to take things personally, but to be, uh, you know, to take it on the chin but to also be very quick in fixing those things. Uh, here's my mistake, won't happen again, I'm gonna do this. And I suppose that's all wrapped in what would be traditionally called the growth mindset, which is not worrying about the feedback, but learning from it, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that answers your question. It might be yeah, bit yeah. I, I want to even dive even deeper because you mentioned so many interesting things about kind of the structure of this setting up quarterly OKRs and kind of, um, the goals that your team needs to achieve and then kind of reporting back on that uh, and uh, as well as on these big company meetings, looking back and kind of painting the vision. So what exactly do you need to share with, uh, like, can you give examples of what's useful to share with the leadership and business team? Because they don't need to know everything and they will be confused about a lot of things, but at the same time, you need to give them the right things so they can still trust you, they can, your, everything is on the right track. But as, as you said, you need a bit of bad, a bit of good. You need the, the real picture. So what exactly would you share and what you wouldn't share with the leadership team? Well, when you've got a, 
an OKR, you've got an objective, right? And that objective is scrutinized and the key results are scrutinized. Um, you're then reporting kind of against how the, the progress is against those. But in order to flesh that out, you know, make sort of people understand the kind of depth of the work that you're doing, it's often about communicating what customers are experiencing with our product. In other words, it's, it's all very well to say you're customer centric, you know, but how much time do you actually spend with your customers? And so one of the key things for, you know, as a design team, which is made up of research and copy and writing and, uh, and product design and strategy and service design and all of that is first of all, that's, that's the critical part of design strategy is knowing what your customers need and how your product and service makes them better. So there's, there's particular points in time where you're going to collate those insights uh, from your customers at, in order to create that empathy. Now, say at checkout, you know, we're very sales driven. It's a B2B organization. So we kind of know what we can sell, but do we know if what we sell makes them better, if our products are actually performing? Um, and we're on that journey right now uh, to kind of expose, well, how does our product fit into their workflows? What do they struggle with? Are we making it efficient? That's the kind of level of, you know, user research that we want to expose. And then you, it's very, it's really quite straightforward then to benchmark that. I'll give you an example. Um, onboarding a new client might take you through quite a few different systems, right? As we do our due diligence checks and so on. That takes a period of time. You can benchmark that and say, well, what's the mean mode or the medium and the average space of time? Well, there's a target there to make that more efficient. So the way in which then, okay, we analyze that and go, well, where's the drop off, right? Where's the, where's the pain points? And you're going to, you're going to have to deliver that very succinctly. You can't go into a huge amount of depth when you're talking at leadership, right? They're not, they're not caring about the depth because they trust you that you've got all that covered. You're giving the, almost like the tweets, <laughs> here's the sound bites. Uh, so therefore you've, you've benchmarked the metrics, you're measuring it and you can then show what the value that we've created by saying, well, if we shorten that space in time, then our merchants can realize revenue quicker. And then you're talking to revenue. So that's how you kind of do the translation of, uh, demonstrating how design can solve problems, but it's not, you know, I think as design, I think, I suppose as I'm very conscious, I don't want to steal people's thunder. You know, I, I very much like, well, it's not just us, right? It wouldn't have been possible if engineering hadn't done, you know, a great job on, you know, all the error states and all the forms and so on that we've spec'd out. It wouldn't be possible without product organizing and coordinating all the workflows and giving a lot of the metrics and so on. Um, so yeah, communicating the value of design, I think it's more communicating the value of what the team has done and design is one part of that. Um, it's a very visible part. I get it. Um, but it's very important that you communicate that it's a, it's a team. Yeah. I think the other parts then when you're kind of communicating is, um, you've got to communicate how it's, how it's contributing to revenue, um, how it's contributing to growth, how it's contributing to costs. You might call that return on investment, uh, how it's contributing to retention. And those are kind of the really kind of core things often that a exec team cares about. And the other two I've, I've witnessed can come, can, can be in conflict, um, which is you're either going to sort of prioritize your shareholder value or you're going to prioritize culture. Cause often if you prioritize shareholder value, then the culture then starts to be eroded or you, you know, and you're constantly having those in check. Now we're not, public right now um but it's one of those things that we we might we prefer and prioritize how is this uh affecting culture you know what do we do when we're exposing uh customer feedback how do we expose people to it? what does that what 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 does that lead to in a uh continuing the culture that we've built so when you're translating some of the design work that you're doing you're going to be speaking to one or a few of those points 
And I think that's important to translate that into the sort of the business language. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, that's something that I've had to learn um, rather than talking in designer speak because yeah. gloss over. That totally makes sense. And uh, I suppose that link between the business side and the design side is something that the design community is now talking a lot about how important it is for design leaders to understand the business metrics that do matter, whether it is um, um, retention, whether it is a, a cost of acquisition or whatever there might be on board in time that costs money. Um, but do you think we should only do things that are measurable? And uh, the design at the end of the day, there are lots of things that are quite intuitive and if we just focus on metrics, would it lead us the wrong way? I think that's that's exactly the kind of tension that we experience is that whilst you can pretty much measure everything, not everything is important to be measured. And there's also the element of, you know what, we hire smart, capable, rational people. And, you know, sounds like a trite saying, but I don't need to go measure whether if I go outside and lick the pavement, whether it tastes nice. I, I kind of, sorry, it's a dumb analogy, but you can test the wrong things just because, just for the sake of testing or, and I think there's a, there's a tendency to sometimes go with testing because of a, maybe a lack of conviction or courage to actually go, to go push it. Um, and you want some other mechanism to tell you. Um, so I think that you're always going to be in that kind of balance. But I think generally speaking, at a at an, an initiative level, right, a particular thing that is funded, you do have to measure it in terms of track it, right? Because then it gets done. Um, but there's elements of how do you measure it, um, you know, one of those things is like, well, what's visually better, right? How, how, do you, how do you measure that? Well, you, you could probably measure it, and we've heard all the tales about how you kind of A-B test the, all of that. But I don't think that's really, you know, where you should be focusing. Um, and I think there you've really got to kind of make sure that you know who the taste makers are in the business, those that are, really have strong opinion and conviction and you're going to be generally kind of managing their, I suppose, their stylistic kind of feedback. Um, but ultimately, you have to then make a declaration and go, you know what, it's, it's me and the CEO that are going to make these decisions. And it's not going to be something that you need to go measure because some things just, they can just be made as a decision rather than tested and verified and, and all of that. Yeah, there's quite a few examples I could give there, but... Uh, spare the time uh no I, I mean if you can give one example of something that maybe couldn't be measured or you just have to go with the gut and either it did work out it didn't work out and how did you explain your decision yeah well the, the one i've given a few times i suppose in various uh, talks i've given is um is a sky scanner um when uh, a, a person performs a, a search they get search results that was called the day view uh, in, in, in Skyscanner. I, what are the flights on those days? And you've got a list of them. And there's a call to action on there, uh, a green button on every single ticket. Of course, if you click that, that sends you to the airline. All right. So that single button was the chief revenue button of the entire business when I joined. So you, you almost dare not touch it, right? Because if you touch it, then that's, that, you know, things could go up or down. And that was an insane amount of testing. I think we did. Oh dear. What, what the, the joke that I played there was with some of the product crew and I'm trying to remember where I got the idea from, but I remember seeing it by some other designer at Google, I think. Um, when, you know, the, the goal was, hey, let's not leave any money on the table, okay? In other words, optimize that button to an inch of its life. So kind of playing back that to the, to the product 
crew, it was, okay, so what you want me to create is the world's most clickable button. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Best. I was like, right, okay. I'll show you what the most clickable button is going to look like. And so you kind of flatten the design out. You round the corners. You put a bevel on it. You put a drop shadow. You put a bit of caustic lighting on it. You probably then start to put like free iPad underneath. If you buy now, the pressure messaging comes up, you know, and it's on fire and it's flashing. And I'm going, is that, that's, what, that's what you want, right? You want the most clickable. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that, that's crazy. You're, you're taking the mickey now. Is that, no, but that was what you're, that's what you're asking for. Well, no, it's got to be harmonious to the design. You know, we can't have everything flashing. And if, when, okay, right. Now, you, now you're talking design language here, you know, to make things not constantly try to push you to do something, but let people make those decisions. As long as you make it obvious and you have clarity on the page. So, of course, we did loads of tests. We still did loads of tests. And I think we did nine different styles of buttons. What was the outcome? You know, we have millions of people coming onto those pages. Um, they're almost negligible. It'd be like you were you were literally picking between maybe a couple of decimal points lower. You know, how much money was that? that actually, if we went with that button, um, you know, that had the rounded corner with the slight bevel and so on, and it had the word select and maybe an arrow on it, uh, how much more money was that a day? It's like, seriously we've spent probably more time and more effort creating the test and so on that you're actually going to make back by having that button in a year and it was just like this is an utter waste of time and that was a real kind of moment in the business it's like just leave that button alone stop do you know what I mean there's way more important things that we got to go figure out here and um yeah, I had really good, robust discussions uh, and debates with, with the crew, but you had to kind of almost go through it to prove to them that, was that a thing worth doing? Um, sometimes you have to let them happen, even though your instinct is crying out, this is going to be a waste. So that's one example. Well, thank you for sharing this story. I love it. And it's uh, definitely the, the great way to prove something is go all the way in and push it to the ridiculous level to show the the difference or the point that you're trying to make um, because I think designers are very nuanced people and sometimes when you're trying to explain the nuances we can get lost in them uh, so I think making something a bit more contrast and showing the difference it's always a great way to to explain what you're trying to do um, this is a brilliant story, thank you. Um, and I would love to talk actually to you about the, your new role, uh, which is obviously at uh, Checkout, and you started kind of recently, which means that you have kind of blank canvas, but also a lot of stress, I assume. Uh, and I would love to hear a bit more about what do you see your role right now? What, what's the most important for anyone else joining the company where they want to make an impact? What, what are you doing at the moment? What are your goals? What are you looking at? Um, and what are you trying to achieve um, at this new role? Well, I know what my priority is right now. Um, it's hiring. And in some ways, I don't see that ever ending as a leader. You kind of, you know, ABR as we always be recruiting, um, and but then you got to ask who are you recruiting, you know, what caliber are you bringing in, and you've got to bring in the best people. Uh, the best people will bring in more brilliant people, so you have to set the bar high, and that's, you know, that takes time, and of course, uh, I would love to hire much quicker, but my experiences are. Actually, you've got to hire slow, hire well, but hire as fast as you can. Uh, take the time to bring in the right people because that's going to set the tone and the culture for quite a long time to come. Um, so, so that's really, I suppose, my, my primary uh, goal right now is, is to build out the team and, of course, support the folks that are already here. Um, you know, joining, you know, fantastic uh, crew on the technical writer side and on the product design side, you know, it was literally a handful of people, four, four people 
Um, and, uh, you know, you've got to really kind of nurture that uh, and make sure that that they are not going to be disenfranchised uh, from you coming in and think that you're going to just, you know, uh, clear the decks and get rid of everything and so on. But actually, they have an awful lot of really good knowledge that you can learn from uh, straight away uh, in, in the business. So I think that was that was me kind of coming in, just kind of making sure I do that. And you've got your kind of general 90 day plan, um, which often tends to go out the window, actually, <laughs> you kind of have a have a plan. And then it's, like, oh, okay, it's like that here. It's like that here. So from from our perspective, it was really about, uh, you've got a lot of things in play already, the business as usual needs support. And you're kind of coming in and you're doing a bit of a listening, but you're trying to put out some of the fires and make sure that you bring some clarity to situations and help people prioritize, but also communicate because the expectation of bringing in a leader is all of a sudden, boom, everything's magic and it's going to be tickety-boo and um, everything will be fixed. So you kind of have to go, look, for the first six months, it's going to be like, it's not really going to change that much, actually. It's going to be, I'm going to be recruiting, I'm going to be putting process in place, I'm going to be probably saying no a lot or not yet, um, and just constantly kind of communicating that. And now we're at this point now where, I think we're getting more well known in the industry and you have to do a lot of the uh, evangelism yourself because no one else will. And, it, you know, uh, our recruiting partners are great, but they're not necessarily plugged into the design space. And we've just recruited someone who now is a dedicated design recruiter. And that just helps with the pipeline and so on. So you're setting all of these streams of work up um, from you know, getting a pipeline of great interviews, then what's the interview process? Do we need to reevaluate our interview process as an entire business? Can I show what a good interview look, maybe looks like and then maybe help the others? What does feedback look like? Uh, then you're going to look at competency frameworks. Okay, what's the leveling? How am I matching with peer groups in the business? A lot of managerial type operational work, how then we're onboarding people in the business um, how do you set up the buddy program? You know, all of those practical things in scale up. But I think you know, coming into checkout where it's you know ten years old, um, design is definitely on the back foot. We're kind of the last discipline to kind of be built out in the business uh, that's that's needed. So yeah, uh, you have to be very patient uh, getting through that. But you have to constantly communicate and set those objectives. Like how many people are we going to recruit? this quarter okay can you fulfill that what else do we need you know it's okrs right you have to set goals and often they are stretch goals uh, but they should be achievable but it might just be a little bit uh, maybe we'll achieve that maybe we won't uh, that's the good that's a good hallmark of an okr um but uh, you know to pop up a level at checkout it's really why am i here often is kind of the question what's your what's your role going to be um and quite simply, it's to uh, to bring in human-centered design practices because we'll, there's always a human at the end of our, our product, so we've got to understand them. Um, and in some respects, that's quite revolutionary to a lot of people. Um, uh, and then you kind of end up going, well, how does that happen? Um, you've got to look at, are people doing the proper analysis on what's the root cause or are we treating symptoms and you're going to do some you're going to educate at the same time and then try and start small uh, so you, you kind of you think big right you've got to have a vision and you've got to align that to the company vision and you're communicating that verbally so you think big but you've got to build small to create the halo effect around that and you've got to act fast and you've got to report so that's just basically the loop think big build small, act fast, and report. Uh, and once you get that kind of flywheel going, you get the you get the general momentum. And we're experiencing now, I've been here now eight months, and I'm delighted to kind of say that, you know, the, the designers have done a great job in conducting their own research, talking to merchants, showing them prototypes, iterating on that, feeding back, um, giving little highlight reels of, this is what a merchant said. 
this is the problem and then now look at this and look at their face and you know and people go oh we want that uh and you create the halo effect and then then you've got a nice problem to have is that well that's why i need x amount of people in the team um so we have a head count now of uh, over 50 uh for the next uh, 12 months so that's a little plug isn't it wow we are recruiting Wow. Well, um, definitely, I would recommend anyone to, to join Buzz's team because I can imagine they will learn a lot from this experience. And I think it's always exciting to be part of a fast growing uh, organization uh, that is trying to change so many things and improve design and very, very design led and design centric on the journey for that. Um, I would love to actually ask you a couple more questions about the, 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 the tough things, <laughs> because you talked about all the great things that happened throughout your career, which uh, obviously are incredible, but we all know that it never goes very easy and straightforward. Do you remember a particular day, a moment, an example, a situation um, throughout your career, whichever company it was, which was the hardest day where you didn't feel like you can make it, you just were down. What was it? Where was it? Or how did you feel? And how did you get out of that? Oh, great question. Um, I, I probably, in recent memory, I think it, probably, probably at Skyscanner, after being about six months in, um, I, I really did have the, the feeling that I was, I was failing um, and I probably was actually, I, but I didn't know what the cause was. Uh, and I suppose the way in which I got out of that was to have a very open conversation with, um, our chief people officer then, uh, and just sort of say, Hey, here's the things that I'm really struggling with. The, the framework there really helped me was, um, Mark Logan, who was the chief operating officer, um, came down uh, from from uh, Glasgow to London, and it was me and maybe a couple of other uh, guys, um, and he did a little day training with us, kind of teach us about kind of all the things that he's learned about leadership. And the one that really gets me, um, and the one that I always tell, is the accountability ladder. And that really helped me get out of this situation, which was um, folks can go look up the accountability ladder. Um, but you have four rungs on uh, the bottom of the accountability ladder and you have four rungs at the top. And the bottom four is when you're playing the victim. And the top four is when you're being accountable. The first rung on being accountable is effectively acknowledging reality, which is, hey, this is happening to me right now. Um, and then you're going to be very quickly trying to go up to the next level, which is ask for help. Right. And if you don't help, think through the solutions and then ultimately you're going to have to own it. Um, now I say these things because I'm preaching to myself every time I say it, but the, the victim mentality is what I see an awful lot. And I was doing it as well. The, the bottom rung is, I don't know. Right? It's my duty to find out. So I can't say I don't know. But, well, go find out. So the second one is, um, you know, you're kind of going, well, it wasn't my fault. Right? Oh, you're blaming others, are you? Right? Not, not, a, good, not a good thing to do. Um, and, and these are all the kind of, we can go, you can, folks can look it up, but that was really helpful for me to get, ha, huh, I'm playing the victim here. And it really kind of popped, popped me out of it uh, to make sure that I was really kind of taking accountability for my actions and team. And I've never forgotten that. Um, it also helped that uh, I was able to get a coach. Um, and I would say that everyone needs a coach just to talk truth back to you and call you out on, on things. But it's also very helpful to, um, talk things through uh so yeah thank you for sharing it i just quickly googled uh the image and i i hear it for everyone who is on the podcast and not googling at the moment so the bottom one wait and hope excuses i can't uh blame others or i don't know 
And the, the, the good ones that we should all be doing as leaders is acknowledging reality, owning it, finding solutions and making it happen. And uh, I think that is a really good way to, to think about any problem that doesn't Absolutely. matter which, which point in your career you are. I think this is a very helpful one. Um, I feel like we are running out of time. So I would love to finish with one last question to you, which is actually um, related to lots of things that we discussed already. And uh, kind of the, the conversation, obviously, we had about leadership and your career and you're at this stage where you've done a lot of things and you've built a really, really great uh, journey and you've done great things on the way. But you have another 50 years ahead of you of brilliant things to do, at least 50 years, uh, and uh, enjoy your life and uh, working for potentially various or with potentially various companies. What drives you at the moment and what aspirations do you have now? Because you've done kind of everything already. What, what do you want to do? I think what keeps you going, uh, or what keeps me going anyway, is, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn and how little you know. Okay? Keeps you, keeps you grounded. So you just got to keep, it's that, it's that curiosity, I think. Like, I, I just, I can't let go of like, I wonder how that's going to turn out. You know, I wonder what the effect of that's going to be. Or uh, do I need to make some adjustments? You know, the joy of doing that and seeing it in people's hands, it sounds trite, but I still get immense joy from that. But there's a, there's a parallel track to this, which is, you know, I'm now 43. Um, and there are other kind of areas in, the, in my life you know, the, uh, very important to me, obviously my family. So work doesn't come in between me and the family, but there's also kind of extracurricular things. Um, and that's what kind of, I suppose keeps me kind of grounded is you have other ventures and curiosities and things you want to go and accomplish, um, whether that's helping in you know youth groups and so on and trying to help kids not make crazy mistakes um teaching them various life skills and so on very important but also I, I built myself a workshop at home i don't get to use it very much but the act of making things physically you know uh, in, in, in wood and metal and so on i i derive immense pleasure from as well but that's probably just more it's just me and the tools and and the wood there's no jira backlog there's no none of that and it's it's quite liberating to just have a single entity that you can uh, look at and, and drive through and deliver all by yourself. But then, you know, that kind of helps you kind of balance things out, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, just the, the joy of seeing other people grow is, um, is very rewarding. Um, and if anyone can learn from my mistakes um, and not repeat them, uh, I'll be delighted. <laughs> so amazing! Oh, thank you so much. And uh, I love the idea of uh, kind of balancing your career aspiration and your goals and things that you do it with other things that have nothing to do with your career, nothing to do with your day to day life, and finding pleasure in whether it's craftsmanship or teaching others and all the other things that our world consists of. It doesn't only consist of this one thing uh, or just family or just work or just one thing. So I love that you, you have this very holistic view on life. And uh, talking about teaching, obviously super excited uh, that you will be teaching on our executive program for design leaders and uh, very jealous of everyone who will be learning from you. Um, and uh, becoming um, cre great creative leaders and running their companies. Um, but thank you for sharing knowledge with all of us. It's, uh, it has been such a pleasure as always, and uh, you have so much wisdom. And I just love how philosophical you are about your life and about your work and everything that you do. So thanks for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you.
Amazing. And for everyone uh, who hasn't seen the previous episodes of the Leadership Series, you can check them out on YouTube as well. And uh, if you want to hear more interviews and great discussions, sign up to Future London Academy's Instagram account. We will announce our next series soon. And of course, follow Buzz everywhere you can. Check out checkout.com uh, for in job positions that he's hiring for because I'm sure that is a lot of fun and you will learn a lot on the way. Thanks everyone for joining and until next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.